Well, by this time, we hope you've had enough to eat and you're ready for the rest of the evening celebration. Please feel free to continue finishing your meal as we begin the program. Tonight, we celebrate the achievement of our graduating seniors as we wish them a tearful goodbye and a charge to keep in touch. We will miss you. We also celebrate the achievement of students who are a few steps behind their senior year, who have been selected for various honors and awards. You have ahead of you a toast, greetings from the faculty, greetings from one of the members of your own class of 2000, and finally, entertainment that promises to be up to the rigors of UMFK standards. We've already met some of it this evening. I want to take just a second to thank Scott Brickman, who played the piano instead of having any here. I want you to know I offered to bring you dinner, you wouldn't let me. Without further ado, I will ask Annette Grant, the boss of the registrar's office, to come forward to give the senior toast. Yeah. 
perhaps that's okay, they'll be satisfied. If you limit yourself to 20 minutes, however, they'll be delighted. On the other hand, if you will shorten it to 15 minutes, they'll be positively enthusiastic. So I'm going to try to shoot tonight for somewhere between delighted and positively enthusiastic. When students have finished a week of final exams, see some, someone step to a podium, they tend to shudder. You can probably hear the feel of vibrations already. What may come to their minds is a quotation from Lule and Tigany. Loosely speaking, this line is that I'm thinking of it goes like this. You would think that we had suffered enough already. I'm privileged to deliver this address the year that we were graduating. I'm the most senior member of our student body in the history of this institution. Tomorrow, Janet Hammond, 81, will receive her baccalaureate degree. It was my pleasure to have her as a student. She is truly a great example of a lifelong learner. To you students who are recipients of awards this evening, to all the students who will be recipients of the higher award tomorrow, the awarding of an academic degree, to all of you who dedicate the following address. We are gathered this evening to recognize some of the noteworthy achievements of our students. This recognition takes the form of various awards. Awards, of course, have a long tradition in cultures around the world. From the laurel wreaths bestowed in ancient Greece on winning athletes, to military medals and decorations, to amateur bowling trophies. All awards are valuable, not so much for the plaques and medals and ribbons themselves, but for what they represent. Awards are the public equivalent of a friend's pat on the back. They are a way of saying, we notice. Well done. But recognition is only part of the message. Awards are meant also to be a positive reinforcement, an incentive to continue a tradition of excellence. They are a way of saying not only we noticed and well done, but keep it up as well. Teachers have become more and more aware over the years of the need to accentuate the positive. This is done in order to motivate the students to greater achievement. A positive approach is effective with every age group. I'm reminded of a story that illustrates one teacher's use of this technique. An elementary school child had been having some trouble catching on, and in response to a teacher's question, he gave an answer that proved that he had little idea what the lesson was all about. The teacher didn't want to discourage the young fellow, so she decided to frame her criticism in terms that took as positive a tone as possible. She said, you know, Karen, there are no wrong answers in my classroom. The fact that you gave a try is deserving of praise. However, if there were such a thing as a wrong answer, yours would be a very good one. <laughs> Obviously, there isn't such a thing as carrying positive reinforcement to an extreme. There are wrong answers, of course. There are mistakes, failures, and defeats. It is important on an occasion such as this one to recognize achievements are seldom, if ever, arrived at in a single stroke. Typically, failures play a crucial role in every success. George Washington lost more battles than he ever won, but he won the decisive battle at Yorktown. Before becoming president, Abraham Lincoln failed in his campaign for the U.S. Senate. Thomas Edison was mocked for trying unsuccessfully some 1,200 different materials for the filament of his great dream, the incandescent light bulb. He tried everything from bamboo to cotton thread to the human hair. One regimented thinker of Edison's day remarked, you have failed 1,200 times, why don't you give up? Edison's reply was simple, I have not failed at all. I've discovered 1,200 materials that won't work. Day by day, the list of possibilities is growing shorter. Each award presented tonight carries with it an implicit acknowledgement of setbacks overcome, defeats turned into victories, failures 
leaders transformed into successes. The one trait that lives in all successful people is not so much intelligence or talent or what, though each of these is a, an important ingredient. No, the one thing that successful people share is determination. The will to surround obstacles and learn from their mistakes. The most successful people are those who have learned to use their failures as the seeds of their eventual success. By the time he was 30 years old, Paul Galvin had already failed in business three times. Nonetheless, he was convinced that his ideas on how to eliminate explosive gases from electrical storage batteries were basically sound. He attended the bankruptcy auction for his own business, and using $750 of borrowed money, he bought back the patents so he could try again. His company became the Motorola Corporation. And when he died in 1975, his estate was worth over $150 million. The great Winston Churchill is another good example of a person who overcame adversity through sheer determination. A person who developed the capacity to make the experience of failure his strongest ally. The details of Churchill's career are well known to most of you. How he was turned out of office twice. How he nearly presided over the fall of England in 1940, and so forth. Churchill's ability to learn from his mistakes was legendary. The story that best illustrates for me this remarkable quality involves one of the more obscure incidents of Churchill's life. In the 1950s, Sir Winston, then retired, was to be honored at a dinner party at a fancy New York apartment. His hostess, a prominent society woman, had chosen to serve cold fried chicken and champagne. When she offered Churchill a piece of chicken, he asked for a breast. The hostess laughed, saying, Mr. Churchill, in this country we generally use the terms white meat and dark meat. The next day, a florist delivered an orchid cassage to this lady. Inside the box was Churchill's calling card, and on the back were the words, I would be most obliged to you if you would pin this corsage to your white meat. <laughs> Nonetheless, learning from your mistakes has little effect unless the lessons are applied to your advantage. This is largely a matter of recognizing and seizing opportunities when they present themselves. It is clear that the students we honor tonight have taken full advantage of their opportunities. They have exploited to the fullest extent possible their opportunity to further their education and to perform in a truly superlative manner. We all know of many examples of the role that opportunity plays in everyday life. As a mathematic professor, I would be remiss if I failed to take advantage of an opportunity to use an incident from the life of a mathematician to make my point. Many people do not know that Voltaire, the famous French writer and philosopher, was also an outstanding mathematician. As a young man of modest means, he noticed that the French government had made a rather gross mistake in the calculation of the payoff associated with the national lottery. He recognized this as a great opportunity, so he formed a syndicate that bought up every available lottery ticket. His share of the profits enabled him to support himself comfortably for more than 20 years, the most productive period of his long and fruitful life. Incidentally, ever since the Tri-State Lottery being New Hampshire and Vermont was introduced 16 years ago, I've been busy as my calculator. Nothing's happened yet. Robert Stroud, the famed bird man of Alcatraz, recognized his imprisonment at Leavenworth as an opportunity to study bird diseases. And as an inmate, he became the world's foremost expert. Alexander Graham Bell was a teacher of the deaf in Boston. He was working on a device to help amplify sound for those of his students who had retained some small fraction of their ability to hear. In the process, he recognized an opportunity, an opportunity to do something with an even wider application. That opportunity became, of course, the telephone. 
an invention that has helped both the hearing and the hearing impaired the world over. Dr. Alexander Fleming's untidy bachelor habits, something like you might see in the college dormitory, <laughs> led directly to his extraction of Priscilla penicillin from the common bread mold. His genius was in recognizing the opportunity. So, we honor achievement, mindful of the fact that most achievements are the result of exploited opportunities, number one, and an unwillingness to accept failure. Exploited opportunities and an unwillingness to accept failure. There is, nonetheless, a third factor, it seems to me, that binds together all significant achievements. That is, in each case, the work got completed. So many talented and well-meaning people start out well, but all too often they lack to follow through. They become bored, or fatigued, or distracted, and they lose sight of their goal. The work remains unfinished, or equally bad, a spectacular start is followed up by a slipshod finish. The world rewards you for what you finish successfully. It gives you little credit for your promising beginnings. There's an old saying that applies well here, well done is better than well said. Yes, successful people follow through. An eager young employee of the Ford Motor Company once went to Henry Ford and asked him how he could best advance through the ranks of that business. The famous industrialist had four words of advice. Finish what you start. He knew that half-completed automobiles wouldn't be sold. Half-baked ideas profited no one. Half-finished jobs were a waste of time and effort. A few years ago, shortly before Christmas, a brilliant student at Yale was taking his exam for the first semester. He had done flawless work for the entire term. And even though he hadn't studied much at all, he was confident that he could post home with an A. He was relying on a good beginning. Anyhow, the final exam consisted of a single essay question, and as you might guess, it concerned material that had been assigned during the last week of the term, and he hadn't read a word of it. That sound familiar? So he wrote on his test paper, God only knows what the answer to this question is. Merry Christmas. He went home for the holidays, thinking at worst he'd get a B in the course. When he got the exam back in January, there was a note on it from the professor that read, I think that your estimate of God's capabilities is accurate. God gets a name, however you get an F. Happy New Year. <laughs> by not following through, by posting, he had wasted the good work of the entire first part of the term. I won't bore you with the retelling of Aesop's story, the tortoise and hare, but the theme is roughly the same. Jackrabbit stars are nearly as impressive as successful finishes. As important as recognizing opportunities, overcoming failures, and making sure the work gets finished are, it's equally important to remember that achievements are past tense. Achievements are history by the time the awards are passed out. And as sad as it sounds, they age very quickly. In a short period of time, an achievement and the award that recognizes it begin to gather dust rather peacefully. Unfortunately, this process begins at the moment the applause dies down and you take your seat. This brings me to the main point of these remarks. I think awards are great. I take a great deal of pride and pleasure in seeing students recognized for their good works. After all, to help contribute to a student's success is one of the main reasons that a person teaches. However, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, awards have little meaning unless they inspire the recipient to even higher achievement. Without this, an award is just a token, a sentimental symbol of past glories, a plaque locked up in a desk drawer. An award should not be only a recognition of past successes. It should also be a challenge to perform at a high level in the future. An award means we think you're something special. We think you have what it takes. Now go for it. 
If an award seems like the capstone of your personal monument, then it really has to be your life's good. An award should be a foundation stone, something to build on, something that renews your self-confidence and spurs you on. Remember, tomorrow's ceremony is called a commencement, a new beginning. I will close after the following little story. Before Columbus set sail to cross the Atlantic, it was believed that the world ended somewhere out there beyond Gibraltar. To the Spanish, in the time of Ferdinand and Isabella, one of the great distinctions of Spain was that it was the last outpost of the known world that had fronted on a great beyond the edge of the earth. Accordingly, the royal coat of arms depicted the pillars of Hercules, the massive columns guarding the Straits of Gibraltar. Below this, the royal motto read, Ne plus ultra, meaning roughly, there is no more beyond here. But then, when Columbus returned from his first voyage in 1493, he came with news of an entirely new world out there. The ancient motto, Ne plus ultra, was now meaningless. In this crisis, someone at the Spanish court made an inspired and thrifty suggestion, which was immediately accepted by Queen Isabella. The suggestion was that the first word of the motto, nay, should be deleted. Now the motto and the coat of arms read, and has read ever since, the two words, plus ultra, meaning there's plenty more beyond here. So, my student friends, whether you are 21, or 81, or somewhere in between. This is the challenge that your award represents. To explore all the possibilities beyond here, to be everything that you can be. May this award inspire you, but never hold you back. There is plenty more beyond here. As for your present achievements, I salute you. Well done. Keep it up, but continue to strive. Continue to achieve. Good luck and God bless.
as we have all demonstrated here today. After tomorrow, our paths will diverge, taking us to places known and unknown. We must take that opportunity and explore the path set before us. As I mentioned before, when we come to obstacles, hills and turns where we cannot see where we are going, we must persist, just as we have in the past, and just as we have in order to achieve this goal that we set forth for ourselves at the beginning of our college careers, when we make the decision to better ourselves and further our educations. Some of us here tonight will go on to continue our education, while others will pursue other career goals. No matter what you choose to do, I wish you all the best of luck, because I know that we can all be successful in whatever we choose to do. Thank you very much.
great deal more polish. Dr. Scott Rickman and Audrey Robichon. Senate Outstanding Senior Award. 
It will be given by Raymond P. Finney, the Student Senate President. And Ray, will you please come forward?
Thank you. As some of you well know, Academic Services is a government grant whose mission is to assist students towards graduation. Well, this evening, the recipient of this award is a fine example of the non-traditional type of student that we serve. Four years ago, she enrolled in the University Success Seminar class, where she was assisted by Academic Services staff. She will be graduating with an associate degree and a bachelor's degree, which she completed in three and a half years with a GPA of 3.4. She was recently hired as an administrative assistant in the same office where she began her studies, academic and counseling services. At the present time, she is using the skills she has learned to assist other students so they too may be successful. You might say she's come full circle. It gives me great pleasure to represent the entire academic and counseling services staff and present this award to Laurie Nenner. Thank you. 
Joan T. Sunday Award to an education student who is obtaining a second bachelor's degree. A student with outstanding academic performance. A student with outstanding campus citizenship. And most outstanding in her student teaching performance. Yes, her caring, warm personality and her sense of humor brought many joys to faculty in the school where she was practice teaching and to the students in her elementary classrooms. She understood the many ways to engage students in learning. She understood that children are unique individuals and that there are many different teaching and learning styles. And that was a lot to learn in six months. I believe that Sally Irvin will be a lifelong learner and that she will continue to grow as an educator. Sally?
The Juanita T. Blake Scholarship goes to a student majoring in English, a graduate of Fort Kent Community High School, and a freshman or sophomore at the university. It's my pleasure to present this award because the recipient tonight not only meets these criteria, but she's been uh, a, a real pleasure in the classroom. In addition to taking her studies seriously and being successful in her studies, she's exhibited uh, the ability to enjoy life on a daily basis. I had uh, eight little children in my home today. They were five and six year olds. And they were inspirational because they're kindergartners and they love learning because they love life. So I would say to Carrie Watson, never lose your joy for learning or for learning. Is Carrie here tonight? <laughs> Carrie's enjoying her evening.
The uh, Grindel Award reads, given in recognition of excellence, of academic excellence and expected future contributions within the area of the social sciences, it gives me great pleasure to present this to a student who has consistently done very well in history, and that student is Travis Devon. Award. It's given in honor of uh, Gretchen Gaffney, who was a student here at UMFK and who, uh, as her husband Tom described it, found her art when she took uh, a beginning art course. And so this award is for a student who, um, in a beginning art course, exceeds her own expectations and does thrilling work. Uh, I have with me Gretchen's sons, Galen and Christian who are going to present the award. Um, it's my great pleasure to present it to Heather Bard. Accepted, and in order for her to get accepted, 
Amy had to undergo an intensive screening process, which included academics, physical agility, oral boards, polygraph exam, and psychological screening. Of all the applicants all over New England who start the screening process, less than 3% make it to the academy. Over, it's okay. <laughs> Over a thousand people applied for this academy, which begins May 22nd. Of the 30 recruits, and that's her new name, recruit. Of the 30 recruits likely to start the 20 week academy, Amy scored number two overall. This is truly an amazing accomplishment, Amy, and we're all very proud of you. Another interesting note I'd like to add is that the state police have an academy every year and a half. We average about 30 people who start the academy. In the last several years, an average of two UMFK students, or UMFK graduates from our criminal justice program, have made it to each academy. Besides Amy, we will probably have two past graduates joining her in this academy, for three total, if my math is right. That's pretty amazing when you think about all the colleges and universities all over New England who have graduates applied to be Maine State Police Officers. UMFK has an average of two graduates in every academy. No other college or university can make that claim. I'm proud to say that Amy Novak will be carrying on that proud tradition. Amy, I'd like to present you this flag, which I hope you hang in your detective's office someday. <laughs> Congratulations and good luck, Amy. I, I wanted her to come up here early uh, so she could start her stress training by being on stage here. Uh, she's going to get plenty of that in the academy. Our next presenter is David Smith, Assistant Professor of Biology and Environmental Studies who will present in Mathematics Science School. Thank you. 
student who is already a nurse, however, has completed all the requirements of the Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Again, this individual must demonstrate academic achievement, leadership qualities, and professionalism. This student has done this and much more. She is an exemplary student with a high GPA, and I met her for the first time last night during our pinning ceremony. She is currently working at Maine General Medical Center and is a fine addition to the nursing profession. Please help me to congratulate Teresa Huta.
friends and family put together a scholarship fund. And the people that are recognized, it's very specific. These have to be students who have, have been exemplary in their studies of forestry. This year, we are recognizing two individuals. And if you don't mind, I'll bring them up separately. The first individual is Brett Labby. Brett, would you come forward, please? This individual is an outstanding student, and on top of being a student, he is also a father, a husband, and the manager, uh, father of a group home, Brett. We're proud of you. Congratulations. Our next individual is one of our new students who joined us this year. He's completed his first year in the forestry program, Andrew Marquis. Andrew? Andrew uh, has done outstanding work in forestry, uh, along with uh, being here as a student. We knew Andrew before he even arrived because he had already planned out his uh, first semester from California via the phone. And Andrew, it's been a great pleasure to work with him. I'd like to introduce Professor John L. Martin, Executive Assistant to the President, to present the John L. Martin Environmental Scholarship. John. Thank you. And those of you who are not aware and perhaps have been here for the first time, let me talk just very quickly about this award. It was a result of 25 years of being in the legislature. My staff decided that they wanted to do something that is to, for a party for me, which I refused. Finally, after about six months of yelling and discussion and whatever else, I said I agreed to it, provided that they were willing to raise funds that would come to the University of Maine at Fort Kent. Subsequently, it provided, after the initial raising of funds, about $55,000, which now is roughly $100,000 in the fund. Part of the requirements is that annually six $500 scholarships are awarded to incoming freshmen here and $1,000 scholarship is awarded to a person who, as a recipient, becomes the person who will work on the Allagash Wilderness Waterway for the summer. With it goes a $1,000 scholarship, and it's my pleasure tonight to give it to a student who happens to be in the environmental science program, Joseph E. Chapel.
it is my distinct pleasure to introduce President Charles Lyons. When I first came here last year, I came in large part because I was so impressed with the President who would come to my campus to interview my colleagues before he would hire me. He wanted to make sure. <laughs> and he has been a wonderful boss, a good friend, and a good colleague. I know he is the same to each of you because I've seen him in the halls, I've seen him in the classrooms, making sure that all of you feel as supported and cared for as I do. So President Lyon, you can please come forward to give your award. Thank 
request of Mr. and Mrs. Werner Hensler, this scholarship was established in memory of their son, Robert, who died accidentally and tragically just after graduating in September of 1982. The Hensler Fellowship is given to someone who has shown courage in overcoming all obstacles and achieving high academic standing and a graduating senior to be able to use this scholarship in graduate school. Uh, I must say, and I, uh, on, a, on a personal note, I stay in close touch with the Hensler family, uh, talking with them several times a year. And this time of year, when we do choose the winners, it's always a pleasure to be able to discuss those people with the family. And they join me tonight in celebrating two choices for the Hensler Fellowship. May I ask Sylvia Dow? Graduation season kicks into high gear. Bob Faw introduces us to one very special graduate. In this season of pomp and circumstance, when careers are launched and youthful dreams are celebrated, there, right in the middle, is Janet Hammond, grandmother of ten, great-grandmother of three, now graduating with honors, no less, from the University of Maine at the tender age of 81. That's right, 81, 64 years after she graduated from high school. 81 years old, oldest woman ever. I think also the dumbest, gee, 81. <laughs> My 10-year-old grandson. Said the same thing. Yes. <laughs> Janet Hammond had always been too busy to go to college, married for 56 years, raising seven children with her husband, Homer. Shortly after his death in 1992, she began the long, windy drive, 15 miles each way, to the university's Fort Kent campus and to her goal, a degree. Ego, well you want to know that you can do it. I knew I was capable of it, so I did it. Majoring in English, she struggled with math, eventually established a shaky truce with computers and also 
forged bonds with students 60 years her junior. I could hardly make it to class. I was, had so much to drink last night. You couldn't quite relate I couldn't, to that. I couldn't, well, I couldn't say, well, gee, so did I. <laughs> On this campus, which frankly is not that much older than Janet Hammond, faculty and students alike say they've never seen anything quite like the graduating great-grandmother. University state. President Charlie Lyons says she is not an outstanding 81-year-old student. She's an outstanding student, period. I'm constantly amazed by her mastery of the language, her mastery of literature, her mastery of life. Mastery. Mastery, yeah. <laughs> Students also found her a unique resource. We'd read things from the, from the 20s and 30s, and she lived that. She's been there, she's seen that, and she can give her opinion on about anything. The graduating seniors were so impressed at their banquet, they not only shared a toast with Janet, they also voted her the most outstanding senior. This year's recipient is Janet Hammond. <laughs> they also asked that she give the senior class address at graduation for her an opportunity to share some inspiration. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, nothing great is ever achieved without enthusiasm. Graduation has brought her attention, but has not changed the simple life she lives just below the Canadian border with Rory, her golden retriever, who's red. Rory, would you care for a dog biscuit? Living quietly and proving, again, age doesn't have to matter. I think the moral may be that you can do what you want to do if you put your mind to it. Amazing, too, when you realize Janet Hammond is not finished yet. She plans to start a master's program. And would like to complete that. And then I'll see whether I still feel like going on to get a PhD. <laughs> Janet G. Hammond, summa cum laude. 81 years old, still inspired and inspiring. For today, Bob Fall, NBC News, Fort Kent, Maine. It is 7.51 on a Monday morning. We're back.